Thank you, officer, very much. Uh, the next speaker will be Shannon McGee, followed by Man Melanie Asseret, I believe, and then Ran uh, Randy Buvala. Good evening. Uh, my name is Shannon McGee. I'm a detective with the Phoenix Police Department. I've been on the department for fif almost 15 years. I moved here to work for Phoenix Police Department because of the um, reputation of the Phoenix Police Department and because of the city of Phoenix. I also came here because of what the packages that they gave for retirement and for benefits. It saddens me that you guys want to cut those. Before I became a detective, I was an officer at that time at Squaw Peak Precinct, now Mountain View. During that time, I served with several officers, and unfortunately, several officers lost, lost their life during those seven years. One of those officers was Nick Erfel. On September 18th, 2007, Nick Erfel, badge number 6994, was shot after he and his partner approached three people for jaywalking and obstructing traffic on 24th Street and North of Thomas Road. One man gave a fictitious name that had an outstanding misdemeanor warrant. As they attempted to take him into custody, the suspect drew a weapon and shot Officer Erfel. He was rushed to the hospital where he died from his injuries and short time later, <clears throat> Officer Erfel was 33 years old and had survived by and served with the department for eight years. He is survived by his wife and two sons. I worked third shift with Nick. I knew him. I also worked with um, Wolf. These officers served to protect this community. That's why I came here, was to become a Phoenix police officer and to protect this community. I'm asking you, please, don't take any more from us. We are worked hard enough, and we do less with more. That's what we've been told for several years now. Please, again, don't take any more. Thank you very much, uh, Officer McGee, and that uh, beautiful tribute to Officer Earthly. Uh, Melanie Bassett, Bassett, is that? What I it's Melanie Barrett. Thank you very much. I apologize. Uh, no, uh, Randy no Bavala will be afterwards, followed by Paul Smith. Melanie Barrett, I've been a police officer for 16 years, and I'm proud to say that I've been a police officer with the city of Phoenix, and I do look forward to continuing my career with the city of Phoenix. I wanted to share a story with you about a friend and a hero. On November 1st, 1999, Goulet Buff, 6896, contacted two uh, suspicious people in the area of 23rd Avenue and Lone Cactus Road. He was by himself, and he detained these people. The male subject, who had drugs on him and had warrants, decided to run. And Buff did what he was supposed to do. He took off, he chased after him, and they started fighting. As the struggle ensued, they fell into the roadway, and a semi-truck hit both the suspect and Buff. Of course, the only fatality was Buff that day. Buff had only been on the department for one year, and he was 33 years old. He left behind a wife and four children. On that day, uh, November 1st in the morning, I was, like many other officers, working third shift. And at that time, there weren't enough patrol cars. So when you came off shift, you had to wait for a car. So when an officer's not on the street, ready to go for first shift, they're still waiting. Well, I was a little late coming in that day, and I walked into the Cactus Park precinct, and Buff was waiting there at the counter, waiting for a car. Walked over to him and tossed him my keys. Talked for a moment, and I said, hey, man, I'll see you later. I just didn't realize that it was going to be at his funeral that I would see him. This department is run so thin, and we are on a skeleton crew. And every day, these men and these women get out there, and they bust their butts. And they do it with pride. And we need to not forget that. 
And we need to not forget about those who've made the ultimate sacrifice, and sadly, sadly, those who still will. Please make the right choice. Thank you, Thank you Officer Barrett. Randy Bubala, do you wish to testify, followed by Paul Smith, followed by Robert Furneaux. Okay, so uh, Paul Smith, is he available? Please. Hi, I'm Officer Paul Smith with the Phoenix Police Department. I've been with the Phoenix Police Department for uh, six years. I grew up in Phoenix. My dad owns a small business in Phoenix. My dad's a pastor in the city of Phoenix. I pay city of Phoenix taxes. I buy Phoenix from my shoes all the way up. I get it. I'm part of this community. I, I want to come up here and tell you, you know, we're just, we're different from this group, we're different from that group, and what we have to do is so much different than what everybody else does, but instead I'd like to invite you on a ride along. Anybody who wants to come with, you're more than welcome to come ride for a night. Councilman Valenzuela, if you want, we can go for a ride along, but my shift's at night, so what's going to have to happen is we have to go early. I have to hit the street at 8.30. So we got to go get ready at 7.45. So we had to cut dinner short. And I had to put my kids to bed already. And you know what? We might, I know it's, it sounds kind of crazy because you guys have been up all day. And some of you have gotten bathroom breaks. We'll have to do that before shift too because we're not going to get them. And if we do get them, it's probably going to be in a bathroom next to some other guy who just pulled a needle out of his arm. I'm sorry if that's too real. That happened last week. I know a lot of guys who do this all the time, and you don't hear from them, and people complain, like, oh, there's not very many of you here to tell us what's going on. Well, that's because they're working, and I got to be at work in six hours. And I was at work until 4 o'clock, and I came straight, straight here just so you guys understand. So I really do. I extend an invitation to you. If you'd like to go for a ride along, I'm more than willing to take you. You can see that we're shorthanded. You can see, and then you can realize what it would what it would look like for cuts and where, it would, where we would take it off. Vice Mayor Waring, you're more than welcome to come for a ride along with me. A good friend of mine, uh, I'm going to tell you about Trav uh, Officer Travis Murphy and I'll leave. Phoenix Police Officer Travis Murphy, number 8474, responded to shots fired. The suspect fled, but a description of his vehicle was broadcast over the police radio. Several minutes later, police dispatch received reports of a male who was seen attempting to hide in or under a vehicle under a tarp at a vacant home in, 19, in the area of 19th Avenue in Fairmont. After uh, Officer Murphy, along with several other officers, responded to the scene and started searching for the suspect on foot. Officer Murf Murphy encountered the suspect and was shot. Officers placed him in a patrol car and took him to St. Joe's Hospital, where he succumbed to his wounds a short time later. Officer Murphy was 29 years old. He was survived by his, his wife, his two-year-old daughter, and his son turns four next week. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Officer Smith. Um, Robert Furneaux is uh, next, followed by Scott Safranca. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, uh, council members. My name is Robert Furneaux, and I am a police detective serving the citizens of Phoenix. I know it's getting late, so I'll be brief, but I'd like you to know about an incident that occurred on January 8, 1986. On that night, <coughs> Phoenix Police Officer Robert T. Fike, serial number 3281, was shot and killed as he stood beside his patrol car behind a Circle K at 11th Street and Indian School Road. Two citizens found Officer Fike lying beside his car and used his radio to request assistance. A suspect who had committed an armed robbery just before Officer Fike's murder was arrested seven weeks later and charged with murder and armed robbery. 
The suspect was convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life in prison. Officer Fike was a former Phoenix Police Department Officer of the Year and had been employed with the department for 10 years. Officer Fike was 43 years old at the time of his death and he's survived by his wife and two young sons. Thank you. Thank you, Officer Fernell. Scott Zafranca. Good evening. I want to start off by talking about Officer Dale Rates, serial number 8899. He and his partner were finishing processing a scene from a DUI stop in the area of 51st Street Ave or 51st Avenue in Cambridge on May 19th of 2013. During that stop and subsequent processing, Officer Rates was struck by another vehicle which was traveling northbound on 51st Avenue. Officer Rates was transported to a local hospital where he died of his injuries. Officer Rates was 29 years old and had been with the department for approximately six years. He was on the 81 King Squad in the Maryville Precinct. Along with this, he was a proud military veteran and he leaves behind a wife and a young child. In following on that, I want to talk about another instance to an officer. On New Year's Eve, while most people were preparing for parties, figuring out what they were going to wear and where they're going, an officer chose, instead of going home early, taking the easy way out, to follow a car believed to be occupied by armed robbers. The car subsequently had an accident. The drivers decide to bail out and start fleeing. The officer, instead of waiting for other officers on that scene, he decides to take action because it was the right decision. During that struggle, the officer was shot in the stomach and had to be placed in the hospital. Members from this council promised his wife that they would take care of him and other for the city. That officer was me. I stand before you now, not fully healed yet. I don't know the outcome of what may happen. I still have futures to go. But do what you promised my wife. Do what you promised the spouses of other fallen officers. Do what you promised the spouses of other injured officers and take care of the officers. We don't ask for much. We just ask for what's fair and what's right. Thank you. Thank you, Officer Franca. Uh, Josh uh, Champion is next, followed by Brian Hanana, Hania. Uh, and there's a few more cards after that, please. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, City Council. I'm Detective Josh Champion. I've been a police officer for just under 17 years, currently assigned to the homicide unit. Uh, for Mr. DeCicio, I know you were having trouble with the numbers earlier. As of Detective Hobbs, homicide, there were 15 officer-involved shootings. At that point, it averaged 5.5 days that we'd have an officer-involved shooting in the city of Phoenix. I want to talk about two officers that did pay the ultimate price. The first one was the very first officer in the city of Phoenix that was killed. On February 6, 1925, it was Officer Hayes Birch. He was shot by two men attempting to siphon gasoline from a car. Two suspects were one in Texas for the murder of the sheriff's deputy and also one in Montana for the murder of another officer. Both subjects were eventually captured. One of the suspects was convicted in Arizona of murdering Officer Birch, and he was hanged on January 8, 1926. The other was convicted in Texas of murdering Deputy Morgan and sentenced to life in prison. Officer Birch was survived by his wife and three young children. It would be 27 years before another officer was killed in the line of duty in Phoenix. Another one I want to talk about was a very hectic day in the city of Phoenix. That was on July 27, 2007. Phoenix Police Officer George V. Cortez, 8232, was killed after responding to a call that a man and a woman were passing forged checks at a business at 83rd Avenue in Cano. Officer Cortez entered the business and was placing the male suspect in handcuffs 
when the male suspect turned, drew a gun, and shot Officer Cortez several times. Officer Cortez was 23 years old and had served with the Phoenix Police Department for two years. Prior to that, he had worked as a detention officer for the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office for two years. He is survived by his wife and two sons. In closing, I want to make a couple points that other officers have, because I'm representative of people that have been up here. I have been able to raise a family, my wife, two children, who have chronic medical issues on a single income for over a decade. This is putting this at risk. Uh, Mr. DeCicio, as I mentioned, it was every 5.5 days that we were having an officer-involved shooting, and we're at 15 this year. As for injuries on duty, I know there are officers out here that have had more severe injuries. I have been kicked, I have been bitten, I have been spit, I have bruised my spinal cord, I have broken my back, yet I'm still here. I've almost got 17 years on, I plan to do 15 more. That's because of the promises that were made for us. Another thing to think about that Officer Rudy brought up is those that can retire, I think uh, the city manager may have a number on those that can retire here in the next two years. We're planning on hiring only 15 officers, a large portion of that could be gone before then, causing issues. And at this point, 2008 was the last time we did a full hiring. In 2015, that would be one third of a normal officer's career before we would even get a new officer on the department. Thank you. Thank you very much, officer. Next will be Brian. Hanania, and then followed by uh, Louis Schmidt, if you wish to provide testimony on this item. Good evening. My name is Brian Hanania. I'm a sergeant with the Phoenix Police Department. I've served 17 years, and I've proudly served with each of the men and women in this room, as well as for the citizens of Phoenix. I'm also a City of Phoenix resident, and Mr. DeCicio, I live in your district. I'd like to remind you and Mr. Mayor that I vote, and I voted in each and every election. Ms. Pastor and Ms. Gallego did not create the situation that we're in, but it is your responsibility to help fix. I've listened to the other members of the other unions speak prior to today, I'm sorry, prior to right now, and there's one thing that keeps coming back, and I think Mr. DeCicio mentioned it. There's a structural deficit. The way this city spends money is a complete mismanagement. We've relined roads that didn't need to be lined in the first place only to repave them and reline them again six months later. We pave parking lots, repave them again six months later. We forged new trails in South Mountain that never needed to be built. We've built a parking lot in the desert at the end of 19th Avenue and Chandler Boulevard which now has become the suicide capital of Ahwatukee. We've decided to paint street names and crosswalks downtown because it's not like we can look up and read what street we're on. We've got to look down into a crosswalk as well. We have police cars and vehicles in this city that are overbilled for basic repairs. And I'll give you an example. One of my officers was in a rear end collision. It was his fault. He accepted responsibility. I go out on scene. We wouldn't have even done a collision report for a common citizen because looking at the damage, it was clearly underneath the state minimum of $1,000. Yet the city of Phoenix billed the police department $4,700, $3,500 from a private vendor, all for under $1,000 worth of work. Now you tell me there's no corruption there. This city and this council needs to decide what's important and what can wait. I'll give you two new revenue sources that Sergeant Keith Doherty from Central City Precinct has suggested. Right now, we can start a process where we do a handling fee for money of all prisoners at the City of Phoenix Police Officers book. There's a corporation that will take 5% off of all monies that prisoners have are impounded with. 2.5% will go to the company. 2.5% will go straight back to the City of Phoenix. Right now, the Maricopa County Sheriff's Office and the Pinal County Sheriff's Office are using that system and it is a positive, continuous stream of revenue. Second thing we can do, by state law, we can charge every prisoner the city of Phoenix books and incarcerates for the cost of their incarceration. It's about time that we charged the people that we put in jail for our services rather than the people in this room and other members, other workers of the city of Phoenix. 
Now, I can sit up here and be fork-tongued and tell you about all the problems that go on in this police department and about staffing, but I'll give you an example of what happened this past Sunday, and I'll yield my time. We had a homicide in Central City Precinct, gang neighborhood. We had 10 officers working the street, plus three supervisors. That one scene took all the officers in our precinct. We effectively shut down one whole precinct in this city for eight hours. You had to pull in police officers from two other precincts to answer calls. And I'll tell you what, I love my brothers and sisters in the fire department, but when my officers and I picked up that 220 pound man, while giving him CPR, put him in the back of a police Tahoe and drove him two blocks out of the hot scene for the fire department to take to the hospital, they wouldn't even pull him out of the Tahoe, looked at him, said he's dead, and went back to their fire station. You can vote to cut our benefits without revenue, but that is tantamount to moral corruption. And stop thanking us and everybody in this room for the job that we've done, because every one of us sees it as empty. Thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you very much, uh, Sergeant. Uh, Louis Schmidt, did you provide testimony on this uh, item? And then uh, the, the uh, last card I have is for uh, President Joe Clure, and then you have a series of cards uh, supporting additional time for you. Mr. Schmidt. Louis Schmidt, President Schmidt. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. My name is Louis Schmidt, the President of Aspen Local 2384, and I just want to thank all the officers, all the women and men that serve our community and keep us safe, and I feel safe in this room right now, so. Um, but I'm not, this is a serious matter we're talking about today. I mean, we've heard compelling stories, and it's not until you hear how the families are impacted that you see what your decisions, you know, how they impact the community. We're not the policy makers. We have to abide by the policies that this council and the city manager make and direct. We don't create these policies, you guys do. Um, Councilman DeCicio, to answer your question again, the city has not accepted any of the fact finders recommendations, none. They want it either their way or the highway. That's, what they're, that's the, the position that the city has taken. They don't want any, they wanted everything, they want every decision their way. Even the ones that are, you know, um, you know that favor plea or any other unit, they don't accept those. They want everything my way or the highway. And I want to tell the officers here, don't be fooled by what you're hearing from Councilman DeCicio. Don't be fooled because two weeks ago, when they had some revenue options, he had an option. The revenue options are the ones that are going to benefit, you know, that restore services and the fire and life safety, and public safety. He voted no. So don't sit here and be, be convinced that they're trying to do the right thing. No. You guys attend the funerals when there's an officer's death. You guys rush to the hospital when there's a fireman's death. But like these officers said, don't come and keep telling them that you're thankful for the service because your actions prove otherwise. You know, we just had a city employee, one of my own members, who committed suicide about two weeks ago right here in, at, in the garage. Did any of you even send anything to the flammy? Did any of you, you know, give a damn and go to the hospital? Did any of you even go to the funeral? You didn't. Because, again, it takes, you have to back up what you say. You can't just say we're thankful for the sacrifices. You know, you guys told the city manager he has to correct morale, that he has to pick up the morale. How is he going to pick it up by telling these officers, these, these hard uh, public servants, that they must take less? These, uh, these officers that protect the, on the, your own detail, uh, city um, mayor Stanton, you're going to tell them to take less again? Again, this council has different options. You're going to spend $2 million to build up that contingency fund. When is it going to rain if it's not, uh, uh, what are you guys going to call it? When is it going to be a contingency? You've heard good stories, and I, again, I don't want to, um, I thank the officers because I feel safe, and I know that uh, our employees in, in, that provide the City of Phoenix service, they feel safe because they know they can rely on these officers. It's a, it's a shared um, service that everybody provides to the city, and the council has tough decisions, but you guys have heard the families, and if you guys want to hear more stories next week, and you know, we can keep you, know, keep you guys here a lot hours on the night. I know you guys want to go home to your families, but that's a sacrifice that these officers make every day. They don't, when they tell their, you know, their loved ones by, they never know if that's the last time. So make a decision, give the city manager some direction, and get off your political agendas and do what's right for the community and for our police officers and all the public servants. Thank you. Thank you. Al Richard, you wish to testify? Mr. Richard, please. Good evening, Mayor, Councilman. My name is Al Richard. I'm a detective with the Phoenix Police Department. I've proudly served the residents of Phoenix for 
17 years. On March 26, 1999, Phoenix Police Officer Mark T. Atkinson, badge 5930, began following a suspicious vehicle occupied by three suspects in the area of 31st Avenue and Thomas Road. The driver lured Officer Atkinson into an industrial area at 30th Avenue and Catalina Drive, where he was ambushed by gunfire and killed. A citizen who witnessed the incident engaged the suspect in a gunfight with his own weapon, seriously wounding one. The two other suspects fled, but were later apprehended. Officer Atkinson was 28 years old and had been an officer for almost five years. He is survived by his wife and seven-month-old son. Councilman, as I've sat here all night, I've heard story after story of sacrifices made, and really there's no way to bring closure or make people whole, but there is something you can do. You can empower the city manager to resolve this. So next week, we won't have to be here. It'll already be done. And from my understanding, three council people have had the courage to say, we will not support this. So I ask the rem remaining councilmen, is there two people that will stand with us and help us make us whole? Thank you. All right, Joshua Lopez. Just provide testimony. Thanks for being here. And then uh, Mr. Clark, did you afterwards, uh, Mr. Clark, your testimony? On May, on May 10th, 2005, Phoenix Police Officer David Uribe, number 4276, made a traffic stop at 3400 West Cactus Road. As he approached the vehicle, he was shot by a suspect. Officer Uribe was transported to local hospital where he succumbed to his wounds later that day. He was 48 years old and had been a police officer for 22 years. He is survived by his wife, two stepchildren, and five children, including his son, Adam, who's also a Phoenix police officer. My name is Joshua Lopez. Uh, City of Phoenix gave me uh, this job opportunity uh, in 1995. It's been almost 19 years. I was in police training in California at the time. As my dream job, I would have gone anywhere in the world for it. And um, I went up here. Uh, the the uh, training I went through in California, uh, when I told him I was going out, get on with Phoenix, uh, it, it was Phoenix was, almost everybody told me what a great department Phoenix was, or what a great city was, reputed as a good city. Now I talk, talk to those same people now and tell them what's going on, how we're not hiring officers till. 2015 or whenever and how long it's been and they just they can't believe it they can't believe what they're hearing um, every day I get on my knees I thank God for this job for my family I've never ever once ever complained that I'm underpaid they don't make enough I never do but now I'm the sole provider of my family now I have concerns about my future or about our future, our financial future, just because, I mean, I make my budget and I don't know what's gonna happen down the road. I'd be the first, and I'll tell you what, I mean, if it, if it meant one of, keeping my, one of my brother or sister officers from not losing their job, I'd take a pay cut in a heartbeat. When I see this city spending millions of dollars on art and signs and dog parks and trains that serve 1% of the population, it, it's kind of hard to have that kind of attitude. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Officer uh, Lopez. <laughs> Mr. Clark, did you wish to provide testimony? Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. And, uh, I feel it's an honor to let me speak, but I couldn't let it pass. I thought you had my card, but with all the officers here, um, I'm not a police officer, and when they say that it's only meant for a small amount of people to do, I'm one of those people that could not do their job. But that doesn't mean I can't be here with our community to support them. Um, I wasn't aware, that's my fault, of the fine details of the promises that had been made to them, that they were going to get their, after they cut back, they would get that back. And uh, I just think you should do the right thing and support them. Uh, I've had the honor of being with police officers, all, uh, serving with them all my life, and the National Guard, 
Um, the bracelet I'm wearing was given to me by an officer who is no longer with us. He was on the Flagstaff to Police Department. Another officer, uh, DPS officer, was hit just recently. Uh, his name was Mr. Huff. And so I, I just know that without the officers, there's a, there's a lot of things going on. But without them, my daughter, myself, my family, we don't sleep safe at night. And this is coming from lefty liberal here. This is coming from a person that, you, you know what, though I've served with, with people, the 1%, the people who are there between us and the bad guys. And yes, there are the bad guys. And uh, sometimes they're all that is standing between law and order and the life that we have. Just look at other countries, what's going on, where chaos is reigning. So I, I just, I, I'm, I'm with them, and I really, really hope that you will keep your promise. And uh, we do need the food tax, and I do highly respect the council people. I respect all of what you're doing, but they're the ones out there right now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Clark. All right, so I, the last card I have is in for Mr. Clore, President Joe Clore. And then you have uh, 20 people have, have given you their time, so you have basically as much time as you want, President Clore. Okay, and if that's not enough, Mr. Mayor, I have to more. <laughs> I'm just kidding with you. Just kidding. Um, my name is Joe Clore, and I'm uh, the president of the Phoenix Law Enforcement Association. Thank you, Mayor, Council, uh, for hearing this. Uh, I know it's a difficult job. Um, let me first start out by saying that I wanted to give a shout out to uh, good friends Jerry and Donna Neal. She's in the hospital. Uh, she would have been here if uh, she was able to. So keep her in your thoughts and prayers. She's been a very good friend to the city and to the community. Um, I got to tell you, I've never been more proud uh, to stand here with these officers and these representatives of the city of Phoenix Police Department. Uh, there's really not a lot for me to say because they've essentially said everything that needs to be said with more elegance and raw emotion and passion than I could probably ever muster. So I just want to thank them, first of all, for sticking in and coming down. I know we've had a lot of guys that have had to leave to go to work. We've had uh, you know, a lot of officers that also have to go to work early uh, in the morning and they've had to leave. Um, you guys have a difficult job, but I quite honestly don't think it's that hard of a decision. Uh, you've heard do the right thing. All I'm gonna say, be short, just respect the process. Respect the process. Um, I didn't plan on reading this. One of the officers that had to go for shift three handed me this and I couldn't help but notice on the agenda there's item 77 waiting to still be heard which is the uh, transfer of Detective Hobbs rifle to his widow Kathy and I would encourage you to approve that. Uh, but I'm going to end with this and I think this is rather fitting and then I'm going to leave the podium. On March 3rd, 2014, Phoenix Police Detective John Hobbs, serial number 5624, and Phoenix Police Detective Albert A.J. Casados III, serial number 8467, were attempting to make contact with a violent suspect. Upon contact with the suspect, Detective Hobbs and Casados made, uh, became involved in a gun battle, at which time Detective Hobbs was fatally wounded. Detective Hobbs was hired on the department on October 22nd, 1992, and had just completed his 21st year of service. Detective Hobbs is survived by his wife, Kathy, and their three children. During this incident, Detective Albert A.J. Casados III, serial number 8467, was also wounded. A.J. is recovering from his injuries. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, President Clore. Uh, so now we've heard, uh, obviously from management, we've heard from representatives of Phoenix Law Enforcement Association, we've heard from dozens and dozens of um, uh, individuals, mostly officers, to provide their uh, testimony. Obviously we're not gonna be voting on this item today with Reunit 4, that'll come back uh, next week as uh, conversations are uh, ongoing. 
Uh, if there are no other people here to testify on this particular item, I'm going to close the public uh, uh, hearing. But council Mayor. members may have additional comments. Uh, please go ahead. Okay. Oh. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it, uh, Mayor. Uh, and I, I don't see if he's still in the audience, but there is a younger officer who had a couple of revenue producing ideas, which I, I deeply appreciate. So thank you, being proactive, and I appreciate that very much. I don't, I don't see him uh, immediately. But uh, ran the same kind of bill at the legislature, put fines on DUI offenders, used the money to pay for bulletproof vests and so forth. Uh, it was wildly successful, unfortunately, because of course people got to commit crimes to pay. I saw it kind of as a user fee. I suggested a similar thing uh, to the city manager when I first got to the city council. Uh, we had a lot of different members. The mayor wasn't the mayor. Councilman Valenzuela, Gago, and uh, Pastor weren't on the council. There didn't seem to, be, seem to be a huge uh, bunch of interest at the time in that, but I definitely think that's something we should investigate immediately. I thought that's an excellent idea. I was unaware of the firm. He mentioned the 2.5% or 2.5%. That is an excellent idea as well. I, it's not a tax increase. It's not even a revenue or it's not even a fee increase. Uh, you have to get in trouble to have to pay it, and I think that's only fair. Uh, why are the rest of us who aren't getting in trouble having to pay this? That was the thinking behind my my DUI bill, and uh, like I said, that generated millions for the state and does to this day. Uh, I think that's an excellent idea that we should investigate immediately, and I'm just sorry I didn't think of it myself. So again, I appreciate that officer stepping up and, and saying that, and I would want you to investigate that as much as you can, as quickly as you can. Thank you. Mayor. Are they very much, Councilman, please? Yeah, thank you, Mayor, and uh, thank you, everybody, for coming out today, and I get the not having to thank you thing, I get it. <laughs> so I'm not gonna do that. I'd like to, but I'm not. Um, the, there were a couple things that came out today. Uh, one was the fact that, you know, and I, wanna, and I don't need to go through all the revenue numbers again, but it's just not a revenue problem. It was literally a priority problem. And look where the city spends their money. I've got a proposal and I want the city manager, and I've heard this several times, tell the city manager to do something. I'm gonna do it in a nice way. Uh, but I want us to look at, and it'll give us an idea of where our priorities are and whether you're on that list or something else is. And I've got some ideas, and now, matter of fact, Councilman Waring and I were kind of trying to figure it out. We're like, hey, look, there are a lot of things here. We come of the, of the school that there's always this government waste that's out there in those areas because it's just lack of prioritization. It's not about the, really about the waste, it's just lack of prioritization. And there are five areas that I want you to look at, Ed. And I want us to have this proposal in place that would not only help these uh, parts of plea and others with the police department, but can also help maybe some of the other labor groups if there's extra money in there. And they don't involve really any cuts to people. It's just stuff that we ought to be looking at anyways. I mean, if you look at the budget that was in there, it had major cuts to police. It had major cuts to seniors and services and everything else. But what you didn't see in there were cuts to travel, conferences, association dues. I mean, do we really need to be doing that stuff when we're short police? So here's what I want staff to look at, um, and in this order, because I'll give you the prioritization. Um, I want us to look at uh, the travel budget for the city of Phoenix. I want us to look at, in this order, association dues that we can cut. I, actually, I want you to, uh, let's make it even more simple. Let's look at everything, I want to know exactly how much money this city spends, this mayor and council spends on travel. And let's start there. And then let's see what the city spends on travel. Then I want us to look at association dues. I want us to look at how much money we spend on conferences. Then this might involve some people. We have outside entities that do the lobbying. How much money the city of Phoenix spends on lobbying and then how much money the city of Phoenix spends on public relations. And I think public relations, I think you'd be shocked by it. it's almost like I think it's like three million bucks or something, isn't it, Jim? It was 2.9 million last yeah, year. Like, I made us I mean, think about it. It's gone down to about 2.6 million. Yeah, I mean, one of the things too, it's kind of a pet peeve, but I mean, our busiest day of the year is what, Thanksgiving? I mean, we've got, I think, eight PR people at the airport to announce that Thanksgiving is our busiest holiday or something like that, <laughs> but outside of that. So uh, if we look at this, I want us to be able to have a counter proposal ready so that we can show, and I think these are pretty benign, if we were to look at these areas of cuts, you know, it's kind of the nonsense part that a lot of us on the council here want to cut anyways, but now we have an area to look at, either or not we want to fund travel, conferences, lobbying, association dues, PR, or police. And I think it's going to be able to give us a really good comparison, 
see how much money it is, and then if there's extra money, which I think that there's going to be a considerable amount of extra money, throw some maybe at Lyona, because they've always been nice. <laughs> but, but if you want to, uh, city manager, well, not want to, I'm asking you to do this, is I want to come out with those budgets, and then I want to see what those would be representing if we could just make sure we leave the police department as whole, um, at least for this year coming up, and maybe moving forward as well. Um, I think that there's more than enough money, even if there was only 50% reduction in travel, conferences, PR, association dues, and lobbying, I think there's more than enough money there to be able to take care of the police officers. And then you're going to be able to see where our priorities are. Is our priorities on us going on a nice jet somewhere and having a nice dinner somewhere? <laughs> or is it going to be the police officers on the street? You're going to be able to see that once we get these numbers. Thank you. That's pretty much it, Mayor. All right. Thank you very much, Councilman. Vice Mayor. Uh, thank you. So the target number for you, just to, I like to be proactive too, and I like to leave with an agenda. So for everybody. So your thing is $4.6 million. That's the equivalent of your cut of 1.9% for this year. Stuff he just listed, which <laughs> I have complained about a lot in my two and a half years on this council, you're going to find out that the conference and memberships are about $1.8 million roughly. That's what it was. Uh, the lobbying will be well over $2 million. The PIOs, we have 26 or 27, or at least we did. I think last year it was $2.6 million. So you don't even have to cut it all to make you guys whole. It won't take care of the other unions. I understand that. They'll complain. I have said I put you guys first, and also, frankly, for me, fire. I'm strictly speaking for myself on that. But if the target was $4.6 million, we could cut that schlock that does nothing for the average citizen, absolutely nothing. And we don't know what the number is for the travel and the, the conferences. Um, uh, but in any case, it's doable. So I, I would encourage you or your leadership to take a look at the budgets. I've done this before and, and really hasn't gotten me anywhere. Go through the budgets and find the silliness. I've talked about some of this stuff, in the, the homes for recycling and the garbage study and all the rest of it. Okay, that stuff adds up to stuff too. But just those three things we just mentioned, they pretty much get you there. So try to find some other stuff and we'll try to make sure that we get the votes to redistribute some of this stuff. This is why I voted against the budgets in the past. It's my third budget on the council. I voted against the first two. We not only were spending money, too much money, we were spending it frivolously. Not only were we projecting way too much revenue growth, but we were also spending the revenue that we didn't wind up getting on stuff we shouldn't have been spending it on, like the Melrose Arch. You know in this budget tonight, you know what we're voting on? $15,000 to light the Melrose Arch. Does that make you guys feel great? Wouldn't make me feel great. I'm not voting for it, but you know, I don't know how it's going to go. It's only $15,000. I guess we have 15 grand laying around to just throw away. I don't feel that way based on the testimony I heard tonight. So, um, and so I'd love to, I'd love to have your help, frankly, in ferreting some of this stuff out, putting the focus on it, and uh, frankly, I guess, sort of embarrassing ourselves into taking a different path. Thank you, Jim. One thing you may want to point out as well is you only need two more votes up here to get to five. Yep. You got three already saying that. There are three of us that have already said we're not going to support that. And I forgot about so Councilman Nowakowski earlier. I'm sorry about that, Mike. So I would get out there and start lobbying this, you know, this idea here, and I Mayor. would literally be pushing this thing really hard. And just Thank get very two, much, two uh, more. Councilwoman, uh, Councilwoman Williams. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I I want to make a comment based on the list you've just requested. If you're going to make that list, there are benefits that come from some of those positions and spending of that money. I'm not saying. It, all, uh, but they also get us the federal grants, it gets us um, child care, it gets us public housing, it gets police grants. It's been most helpful in ferreting out where there's revenue in Washington and simply uh, in the state as well. Uh, I know when I went uh, last month to Washington, uh, that lobby firm took me from office to office, whether Justice Department or uh, a COPS grant, uh, I was human services, aviation, DOT. I mean, we went hit all those places and found out where there's grants, where we can possibly get grants for more officers or, or to supplement programs that are there. So they do serve a purpose. So when you're preparing this list for them, we also give estimated revenue that many of these positions have raised for us. 
I can't disagree that everything uh, is, needs to be maybe at that level, but they do serve a purpose. But now I also have a couple questions for staff, if I may. Of course. On, on the slide, on the presentation, I think it's seven and eight, because repeatedly I heard we've been cut, cut, cut. And these slides both indicate an increase. Can you tell me what the time period is? S slide seven and s slide eight. We put it up on the screen too, I guess, uh, so everyone uh, in the audience oh. at home can watch it as well. Can we go back to it, possibly? I'm, at least that's what's yeah. on my handout. Okay. okay. Just come on here. I think you just went by. There you go. Right. Now there you show an increase that they have received in yes. the last few years. Mr. Mayor of the Council, uh, Council Member Williams, this is a snapshot in time taken in a uh, survey that was done in March of 2014 of the current salaries and wages in the Arizona cities of Phoenix, Scottsdale, Tempe, Mesa, Glendale, Chandler, and Tucson for police officers with 14 years service, which is the average years of service of our police force today. So you're telling me that the average police officer right now has a, a salary of 70,000 plus benefits? Yes. Okay. Can uh, I, oh, I'm sorry. No, I, I, you know, I, I do support the police. I, I also know the impact that not only the officers that have uh, paid the ultimate price, but I know many officers that have been damaged. I can think of Jason Checkerly. I was just at a meeting with him. It, it is a tough position and it takes the tough people. But I, I am more interested in adding police officers than I am raising salaries. I have to be just truthful about it. I think that that's where the real need is in this community if the average one is getting 70,000 a year. I think it is important that we continue to find ways uh, to make cuts so that we can then go hire officers. And I would encourage uh, you to continue to uh, negotiate, to come up with alternatives rather than just doing take home paycheck, find other options, uh, allowances, you have the list, um, and to find a way to make the cuts um, so that we could find a way to fund more officers. And I guess I would encourage Will, wherever you are, uh, to take this and go back and talk and find ways to work this out because I think it takes teamwork. We are all in this together. And um, I know how much the community appreciates you. I hear it everywhere I go and how much you're supported. Uh, but I, I have to say on the food tax, uh, I might have a lot of people at the budget hearings say do that, but I have received a heck of a lot of phone calls, emails, and personal conversations that say don't you dare. So I will support it if it goes on the ballot, uh, but I won't initiate it. So thank you.